Let me now introduce my dear friend, Madeline. Madeline and I actually met in the very early days of the pandemic. She was out and about telling these different organizations and companies about her knowledge and resources, and she was offering them for free to help business owners everywhere. And we thought, this is our kind of woman. We need to partner with her. So Madeline is actually an expert in home services. She's done a ton of industry-specific webinars for us in that industry, converting leads into sales, tons of other types of topical things for those industries. But today she is doing something that almost any industry provider can take a learning away from. She's giving us a webinar on leadership. I will let her deal with the meat of the presentation, but Madeline, I just wanted to say thank you again for making time for this group. We love having you, and I'm so excited for those who haven't met you yet to see your energy and get all the great insights you have to share today. Well, thank you so much, Emily. It's really my pleasure to be here. As always, I love it when Yelp invites me to come speak to their professionals, and I'm really excited to be maybe seeing a bunch of new faces today that we haven't met before. So really excited to dive on in. So thanks so much, Emily, for having me. Let's just, let's just without further ado, let's just jump on in. So today, what we're really going to be talking about is management excellence. I mean, the subtopic is how to get people to do what you need them to do, right? Because that is such a challenge sometimes. And then what do we do when they don't? What happens when they're falling short? So that's what we're going to be diving into really deeply today. And before we jump all the way into the content, I just wanted to give those of you who might not know me a little bit of information about who I am. So my name is Madeline McRae. I am the owner and founder of Emma McRae Coaching and Consulting, and I work with small to mid-sized business owners in the home improvement space and beyond to help them build their business with more intentionality, to take that large, long, hard path of trial and error and even it out a little bit by making the secrets of the top performers not so secret after all. There are things that are just standard and true no matter what type of business you have, no matter what you're doing for your consumers, no matter what you're doing for your customers, because you're dealing with people dealing with people, right? So we have a lot of things that we can learn and we can implement to make our business life a little bit less stressful and a little bit less just guessing, right? A lot of us are doing some great guessing, right? We're smart, we're ambitious, we've been well-educated, we've been understanding what our team is looking like, what our business is looking like. And today I wanna give you just a few targeted insights into leadership and management. What that means specifically is that we're gonna be exploring how you can help make your team more successful. Because we all know that our success is predicated on how well our team can execute to our expectations and to the expectations of the consumer. I've worked with thousands of small to mid-sized business owners digging into what is the crux of their issues and how can we help them get out of the way of these things and really success uh, move towards success more predictably. And one of the things that gets in the way all of the time is that they don't understand the primary fundamental of management. People misunderstand what management is all about, and they have this negative perspective, this, this bad narrative going on in their brain about what management looks like to them and what management really, really is. So I want to demystify that for you today so that you can walk away from this uh, webinar understanding what management is and honestly what it isn't. We're going to be looking through what we can do whenever you have a team of people, whether it's one or two or 20 or 50 or more, that you need to galvanize towards an outcome. You need to get them excited to do what it is you need them to do, even if that means change for them. Right. We all know that change is hard for people. Right. If you believe that most people believe change is hard, pop into the chat. Yes, I do. Cho true something. Let me know that you believe that, too. So many people are change averse. They don't like doing new things. And then when we ask them to do something new or different or to to get on board with a with a new idea, maybe even you think, oh, my gosh, that's hard and stressful. I want to give you a couple of things that make it just a little bit less hard for you to create those changes. And then we're going to be looking at something that I love, one of my favorite things that I teach called the money test. And it's about looking at the value of your time and your contribution within your business in a whole new way. So I think you're going to love that. And last but not least is we're going to be looking at how to provide constructive feedback. What do you do? 
whenever someone still isn't getting on board. You've thought through all these things, you've done all these things, and still they're marching to the beat of their own drum, no matter what you do. And you got to rein them in. You got to tell them that what you're doing isn't cool, man. And you got to get them on board with what it is that you need them to be doing. So again, I know that those conversations can be really intimidating. And so I want to give you a simple, but powerful structure that you can make them not as intimidating, right? Not as intimidating. So here we go. Management. This is one of those words, one of those topics that even in the most ambitious, um, gritty, tenacious owners and leaders can make them feel a little bit wobbly inside. It's one of the things that people shy away from. So we are absolutely needing to reconsider why does management make us feel the sense of dread, this feel of like, oh, because if we have a sense of dread about management, if it's a real big thumbs down for us and we don't like it, we don't want to do it, we're going to deprioritize it. It's going to be really at the bottom of our to-do list because we're avoiding it because we think it's hard because we think it's something that it's not. A lot of times when we're talking about management, we misunderstand it as leadership. Leadership and management is like all, all melded together in one phrase so often, but leadership and management are not the same things. They, they, they have a different emphasis. And in order for you to embrace management, you have to truly understand what it is. I'm a big believer in definitions because in order for you to have this, this, this inspiration to go forward, you have to, you have to understand it. And you always got to go back to the, what is it at its core? What is the definition of the thing so that you can start to embrace it and you can know what it is and not feel intimidated by having to be a manager of your business. So let's look at the definitions here. Management. Management is not leadership. They are two distinct priorities inside of your business, two distinct functions that you have to do as a leader, as an owner you have to both manage and lead your business. So let's look at the first one, management, the process of dealing with or controlling things or people. That's a pretty jam-packed definition. We're gonna be looking at that. So it's the process, the step-by-step -step elements of dealing with or controlling things, outcomes, or people, the humans in your organization. And leadership is the action of leading a group of people. It's an action that you take you are moving forward and being at the front. You are understanding where you're moving towards and you're getting people to follow you towards that. Where in management, you're dealing with the ramifications of what that leadership journey is happening, is happening up there. If you look at it in a different way, sometimes just looking at it from a different perspective, if leadership is giving that destination, you're saying where you're going, management is the function of charting out the exact course, right? So the managers inside of your business are the, are the, the GPS, the magic behind the GPS, right? We pop in an address in our GTA, GPS, we click calculate route, and then magic happens and blah, the route comes up. That magic moment of the route coming up is really the, the in the trenches management of your team. If you do not set a, set a destination, how can you manage to that outcome? If you don't know where you're going, how can you calculate a route? You have to make sure that your leadership is in check, that you're, you're really giving people a clear indication or each individual a clear indication of where you want them to go, and then you can chart the course. But you can't just trust that people are going to go the way you would expect them to go. If all you give is the destination, which means all you do is lead and you don't manage, people are going to try and get there however they feel is right. They might take the route around and around and around and around and around and finally get there eventually where there was just a straight line they could have walked had they known. Management assumes that people are smart and capable, but they need some guidance and it provides the guidance along the path. Has anyone ever caught themselves saying, oh my gosh, why do they keep doing this? Why does this person keep doing this? Why does this team keep doing things this way? I've told them so many times how to do it differently. I've told them so many times 
why to do it differently. I've told them so many times what I want them to be doing. Have any of you, I know I'm asking you to get real vulnerable up in here and pop into the comments. Have any of you ever caught yourself saying this? So I'm gonna lead the charge. I personally have absolutely found myself saying this, right? So I actually was leading a team in my corporate career. So I had a very successful corporate career. I was super fast tracked. I went from being in the field to the youngest member of the executive leadership team in 18 months, y'all, 18 months. It was pretty epic and also pretty intense, right? I had to say no to a lot of other things in my life to be able to say yes to my career at that time. And I remember when I started managing a team that was an hourly working team. I had always worked with a salary team or sales teams. Sales is really... Um, my jam, it's really where my roots are. And then I developed management from my sales acumen. And I remember one time I had this team member who just couldn't stop doing things this way. And I had corrected and corrected and corrected and corrected and they just couldn't stop. Whenever we find ourselves saying, why do they keep doing this? The problem is actually not them. The problem is the person who keeps repeating it. Ever heard that like definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and over and expecting a different result? If the approach that you have been taking is not leading your team to the outcome you want them to be having, guess what? You need a new approach, okay? So the reason I shared that I've done this is that this happens to the best of us, right? It is easy for us to get in the way of ourselves and to really ask about, oh my gosh, why do, why do they keep doing it this way? when we've told them. Remember telling someone and having them understand are two totally separate things. We may have told them and we're assuming that they've gotten it because they understand the words that we're saying, but they really haven't gotten it at the deep root level and that's what we need to address. Management is that process of dealing with people. You have to take the time to work with your team. If you're just telling them what to do, and they're not doing it, there's a gap. And you can fill that gap with a couple of different things. And there's a few elements, little checklists you can run in your own brain to see what you need to adjust in order to make this shift in your business so you don't have to keep saying this to yourself. Because we all know that is freaking exhausting, right? It is so tiring to keep telling and telling and not to see the change or the action that you wanna see. So you have to take a look inside and ask yourself if you've given them these four things. Have you given them purpose, tools, training, and time? So I, if you're taking notes, if you're a note taker, feel free. We're going to dive into each one of these. But this is also on going to be sent to you, this slide deck. So you don't have to do screenshots and capture it. It's, it is captured for you, and you'll get a copy. So ask yourself, have you given them purpose, tools, training, and time? So purpose. Purpose helps them feel like part of the solution. It tells them the why behind the what. A lot of times we're telling them what to do. We're telling them the outcome we want, we're giving them the destination, but we're not telling them why are we going there? We're not telling them how does this serve you? If you've never heard the phrase with him, what's in it for me? This is the day that I want you to learn it. If you're today years old when you learn it, great. With him, what's in it for me? Remember, each individual in your organization needs to understand when you're asking them to change that there's a benefit to them, whether it's a personal benefit to their career or to the, the acquisitions of new skills, there is a benefit to them or to their contribution to the larger whole. Maybe this is gonna help the business run better. This is gonna give your customers a more predictable outcome. This is gonna make you more efficient so there's less touches, but sometimes there's a little bit of pain in getting to that gain. You have to give them the purpose, the reason why they individually, this one human being is important to the success of what you're looking to have done. Because if they don't feel convinced that there's something good here for them, then they're not gonna be willing to go through the difficulty of the change. So you have to give them that purpose. Humans by nature like to have purpose. We like to have a higher cause that we're working for and we, you have to spell it out for them. You can't assume that they know. You have to tell them, even if you think that they know, say it again, right? I had a, a teacher way back in fifth grade. The one thing I remember about fifth grade is that he used to tell us all the time, Repetition is the branding iron of knowledge. 
Don't tire of telling people the purpose. Don't tire of saying it again and again. Just like in branding, you have to have seven to 12 touches for people to feel connected to your brand. Why would it be different? You're internally branding this change. You're helping them feel connected to it. And this is a super significant piece. Don't miss it because it feels a little bit woo-woo, feels like, oh, you know, maybe that's a little bit too far out there. It's not. We all wanna to work towards a higher purpose. Next, tools and training. When you're thinking about tools and training, you have to ask yourself, have I given them the necessary elements that they need to be successful? Maybe it's software. Maybe it's a, a checklist. Maybe it's something really um, simple that those tools and training can solve. A tool is anything that they're going to use in the execution of their job. It doesn't have to be fam fancy. It doesn't have to be formal in order for it to be effective. Training, on the other hand, is the step-by-step -step instructions of how you do something. I know that many, many, many business owners don't have their standard operating procedures yet. That's okay. It's a growing process. Not all small businesses have it. But training can be done alongside of you, right, by learning, by watching, or by having you tell, walk them through the steps. But you have to make sure that they have both the knowledge, the what the steps are, and then that they can demonstrate the ability to do it. Knowing how to do it in your head and being able to execute it are two totally separate things. So when you have the tools and the training, make sure that you've given it broadly enough for it to be applicable, right? And I do see a couple of questions coming in. I'm watching those. We will absolutely tackle those at the end if you're not getting them as we go along. So keep populating them. I love seeing them. We definitely will be tracking through a couple of them. So as we're going through these tools and the training elements, you got to consider one last piece, and that's your time. And we're going to circle back to some of the tools and training here because time is a really significant piece of this puzzle. I will never, ever forget the moment when I realized that management takes my time, right? So I was... Um, I'm just going to stop my screen share here for a quick second and tell you this personal story because it was a really important one for me. So I had told you, I told you about my journey where I started managing this larger team of hourly workers. And I had spent the whole day, one day in my office, I had a really important big presentation I needed to make to the CEO and I was, had been preparing it. And it was, I was on a deadline. I had to deliver it the next day and I was still working through it and it took a lot of concentration work, but I also had an open door policy. And all day long, team members kept streaming into my office to ask me questions. And I was being interrupted the entire day and I didn't make the progress that I needed to make on my presentation. And on the way home, I kept my cool. I was pleasant. I was cordial. I helped everyone who came to my office. None of my team members knew that I was underneath. I was really frustrated. But on the way home, I had a long commute, like an hour and a half. I called my dad. Now, my dad, may he rest in peace, was my person. And I told him, oh, my gosh, dad, I just spent the entire day doing nothing. I got nothing done. I had this huge presentation. Now I have to take it home and finish it. And I got nothing done because all day long, people interrupted me. And that's all. I just handled other people's problems all day. That's what I did. And he laughed. He laughed at me. And he goes, oh, Maddie, welcome to management. And that was my aha moment. When you are a manager, management takes your time. Management of other people, helping them do what they need to do, helping your team get to the intended outcome, that is you doing your job when you're a manager. And there's the great art of learning how to get the things you have to get done done and also making that time for management. It is so important to remember that management shouldn't be treated the way I treated it in that story. It's not some annoying afterthought that prevents you from getting done what you need to do. It is an essential element of the success of your overall organization. And in order for you to be effective in getting your team to do the things that you need to do, you need to consider the various types of time that you need to spend in supporting them. When you're talking about that learning, right, that training, you need to pay attention to have you given them the time to learn and to adjust, right? The time to get used to doing things in a new way. 
When you've always done it one way and now they need to learn how to do it another way, the learning is only half of the equation. A lot of people will give people, their team members, time to learn, but then they forget that there's an adjustment period after the learning where they're still going to be making mistakes and you have to allow for that. Next piece of time is in their schedules. You have to give time in their schedules to do the new work that you're giving to them. Maybe, as I said, that adjustment period, it takes them longer to do the tasks during that kind of ramp up phase. Maybe you need to carve out time for that training. Maybe you need to carve out time for them to just play and practice with some of these new tools and techniques. Consider what's true in your organization and what you're trying to get people to do. And are you actually giving them the time in their schedules that they need? Remember that their time management skills may not be as rich and robust as yours. You might need to work with them to help them figure out how to fit this new thing into their schedules. Last piece of time is time in your schedule. That was my story about management takes your time. You need time to coach them, to encourage them, to correct them, to support them. And if they feel, if you have team members who constantly feel that you're being irritated and annoyed and um, taken off of your tasks by their stuff, then they're not going to want to come to you. And they're going to maybe hide some of their incapability, and you're not going to get that chance to help them up level the way that you could if you were more gracious and more generous with the time that you're giving to your team. It's not a wrong thing when we really think that management takes your time. It's not wrong for you to have to carve out time in your schedule for your team members. It's normal, it's natural, and it's excellent management to do it in a, in a structured way, right? Having meetings with people, having one-on-ones, having morning huddles, having team meetings, these are essential pieces of long-term success. And you've got to make sure you're giving your team your time. Absolutely. All right. As we're going through this, we're going to be rolling right into our money test. So any questions that you have about this high level perspective of management and getting people the things that they need, the tools, the time, the training, and even the purpose, make sure that you share those comments or those questions right in the Q&A. And I will absolutely give some time to answering any questions you might still have, any lingering clarifications that you might want. Pop them into the Q&A box so that I can make sure that I get them at the end. But let's roll right on in to the next piece of what I wanted to share with you, the money test. So I love the money test because first of all, money's really fun, right? We all are in business to be lucrative, to be profitable, to make money so that we can have and use and grow the money that we, we need and want to do greater things in this world for our benefit, the benefit of our families, et cetera, et cetera, right? Money is a good thing. Profitability is a good thing. And what I want you to consider today is your money test as relates to you, the way that you show up in your business and how you're using a really precious asset that you have. You want to consider that inside of your business, there are different activities that have a different value when executed by you, okay? You, as the owner, as the leader, as the manager, have a premium on your time. You bring a certain set of skills and a certain set of vision and certain strengths to the table. And in your positional authority, it means that in your actual title, if you're the CEO or you're the general manager or you're the leader, the, the owner, your positional authority in the business gives value to different activities than if you were a worker bee in that business, right? Your position matters, and you really need to consider the value of different activities. I like to look at them in four different quadrants, entry-level activities, intermediate-level activities, senior-level activities, and executive-level activities. When we're thinking about these activities, I want you to think about them in terms of the value of your time. When you are considering your, what your time is worth, what one hour of your time is worth to you. And then you consider what the value of these different levels are. So let's say an entry level activity. Maybe we'll, we'll assign that, let's say $10 an hour level, right? That's something that you're paying. I know it's not exactly what you would pay. This is just to interpret in your brain, right? I'm not suggesting you, you underpay for these. 
this is not necessarily how much you pay for this activity, it's how much value there is in you doing it, right? If you're an executive level, if you're the owner, the leader, and you're doing an entry level, there's a huge gap in the value that you're contributing, right? So I call this the money test because if you're devoting your time, which is the only non-renewable resource you have in your business, time once used is gone, right? The only non-renewable resource, when you're using your time in these other levels of activities that don't suit where you are, your positional authority, you're squandering that. And time is money. Time is what converts to the value in your business, to what you're contributing. So let's go ahead and dive into a couple of these activities. Entry level activities. So think about in your business, an entry level activity is something that someone with very little skill can execute fairly effectively, predictably, right? So things like answering phones, looking up information on product, maybe tracking shipments, running errands, covering shifts in the store, or the warehouse or the showroom, doing cleanup, right? I have watched business owners devote an hour, two hours of their time a week to sweeping the floors and taking out the trash. That's not to say that those activities are beneath you. That's not it at all. It's that if you have those two hours that you're giving to something that you could teach someone else to do, right? There's highly easily fine people who can sweep the floors for you. You're not giving that time somewhere else that could be a much more rich investment in your business than these functional must-dos. Entry-level activities in your business have to be done. They just don't have to be done by you. And as you think about the title at the top, so I'm thinking owner, manager, that's where I'm thinking here. If you are in a different position, what's in your quadrants will change, right? These, love, these activities suit the roles that we're thinking about today. So let's also think about buying supplies, right? Nobody wants to run out of toilet paper. We all heard what, we all felt what that was like in the early days of the pand pandemic. Nobody wants that. But does it need to be you worrying about that? right? Isn't this something you could easily delegate to free yourself to work on things that you have more specific skills and strengths to bring to the table? Think about intermediate level activities. These start to get a little bit more tempting, okay? A little bit more tempting, but note the title is still in red. As the owner, as a leader, these are still danger zone activities for you. You should not be doing these by, with the bulk of your time, okay? So booking appointments, if you don't book appointments, especially if you're doing in-home sales or you're working with consumers, if you don't book appointments with people you're running services for, you're not gonna get their business, okay? So it's critical. But again, this is not something that only an owner can do. You can teach somebody how to do this. Managing projects. If you make promises to customers, you have to be sure to follow through on those resolving issues. If these are simple things like tracking a shipment or checking in on a status, you can train someone how to do these functional elements. Remember, management is about helping the people figure out the process. And that's why these intermediate level activities are getting a little bit more significant. If they're not done, they can have a bigger effect on your business, but yet again, doesn't have to be you. Completing paperwork. This is one of those where you have an owner operator, someone who's still really in the thick of their business, like many, many of you on this call. It's so tempting. I have watched owners spend hours and hours and hours and hours of their personal time at home, after, after or during their family time, after their family time, working on paperwork, where if you taught someone how to do it, you could be free of that right? Ordering products, handling inventory. These are all intermediate level activities. You need to ask yourself, is this the highest and best use of my time? Now we're getting into the green level activities. These are these senior level activities. This takes someone a little bit more business acumen. This takes someone with a little bit bigger picture thinking. This is something that, that there's a smaller group of people maybe within your organization that could do. And these are more appropriate use of your time. Return to the green category, right? So things like Sales, vendor meetings, advertising, satisfaction surveys, onboarding new team members, and getting new tools and new software. So I want to jump in to why vendor meetings I put in this stage. Think about the people who you rely on for critical things, whether it's product or service or support. Let's say something goes wrong and you need to help their help right away. 
having rich relationships with your vendors of every different type within your business, people who support you with critical aspects of your business, those relationships can save you when you're in a crisis. If you don't invest your time here, you're going to end up, if you're in crisis, not having that, that bank to pull from, right, of that invested time. Advertising, this is how people get to know about you. This is what generates those leads. Satisfaction surveys, making sure that your, your people, your consumers, your customers are happy, making sure that that Yelp is, is a five star, right? Making sure that you are keeping your finger on your, your reputation, that you really know where things are in terms of how happy people are onboarding new team members. So no matter how big your company gets, I want you to always keep your finger on the pulse of onboarding those new team members because you got to pass that culture right directly through to new, new people. And it's important to do. Adding new tools, new software is a way that you're, you're making, keeping more of the money that you make when you gain more efficiency. In these senior level activities, you're either making money directly or you're preventing loss of money. You're increasing efficiency, so you're saving time, you're saving money, right? So these are things that are really helping to keep your business healthy and stable. The larger your organization gets, the more you even need to step away from these activities and apply yourself into the last level, which is going to be our executive level. But before I go on that, I just wanna say one quick word on training on professional skills. This is so critical to you and to your team members. You need to keep upping your game. It's actually why you're investing your time here because the more you sharpen your own skills, the more you have to give to your business. So this is something that's really should stay on your radar and really keep you, keep you high on, on those activities because it really up levels your game. Okay, so finally, last but most important are the executive level activities. Now I promised you that I would tell you kind of how much time you should be spending. As an owner operator, someone who's really deep in the thick of your business, you should be spending at least 60% or more of your time on these two green categories, on senior and executive level. A lot of people are spending more like 70% on the other categories, right? So look at how you're spending your time and ask, run the money test. Are you investing your time wisely? and making it an asset in your business, or are you squandering it by doing things that other people could easily be trained to do? So these executive level activities are the ones that when you invest your time here, when you are managing a team, but also carving time out for these things, these are the things that really move your business forward in leaps and bounds. And the larger your organization gets, the more and more of your time should be devoted to your executive level activities. Hiring decisions. Whether you have a team of two, a team of 20, or a team of 50, 60, 100, every person you bring into your business impacts your business significantly. The smaller the group, the more each individual impact is felt. So you need to be involved in helping shape the culture and the team by making really good hiring decisions. If you're really lack in this skill, I actually ran a survey the other day among my, my audience, my people that, that know and love and trust me. And I heard back that 82% of people, 82% of business owners felt intimidated with hiring. That is a great place for you to enhance your skills because it's key to your long-term success. Developing your people, giving your time to management right? Making sure that you're helping the people in your team improve their skills, improve their ability to execute towards your outcomes. Process improvement, making, holding yourself accountable to say, are we doing this the best possible way? Yeah, what we're doing is working, but is it really working effortlessly? Is it really as clean? Is it really as predictable? Is it really as measurable as I'd like it to be? and implementing those processes. I've helped so many of my clients develop out their standard operating procedures. What does it look like step-by-step step to execute towards these outcomes, right? What does success look like in your organization and are you improving that? Reputation management. I talked a little bit in our senior level activities about that, that satisfaction survey, making sure that people are happy. But in this case, reputation management, making sure that that online and offline, people have really great things to say. And the way that the best way to manage your reputation 
is to management the out, manage the outcomes, right? Is to make sure that you are consistently setting your people up by giving them the purpose, the time, the tools, the training, and the time to execute predictably so that people always know what to expect, right? I like to think about this as like the McDonald's experience. If you go to McDonald's, you know what to expect every single time, no matter where in the world you are. I don't know why, but when I used to travel to Europe often, I was always got a huge kick out of going to McDonald's and trying the different flavors of shakes that they had in different countries. It was so hilarious to me because it was never something here, but it's always the same sort of thing right? Still the same experience. Reputation management, making sure that your brand is aligned on all the different platforms and that you have a strong reputation out there in the marketplace. Media and marketing strategy. We talked about advertising, the nuts and bolts of where you're going to put your money to generate leads, but thinking broader picture. What is your brand like? What is your brand experience? Is your current brand matching where you are or has, have you outpaced it? Have you outgrown it? Maybe we settled for something that was good enough at the beginning, and now it's time to up-level and upgrade. Expanding your sphere of influence partners. This is one of my personal favorites because I love business development. When you think about the people who are in your circle, who you influence, the people who bring you business, the people who you bring business, the people who support you, if you can expand that sphere of influence, it's dramatic that the unintended trickle effect that has on the success of your business, because the, that whole concept of birds of a feather flocking together, right? You really, the more you can expand your sphere of influence, the people who bring you business, the people who refer you, the people who trust in you, that even including some of those customers, those raving fan customers, the more exponential that result can be. Coaching, mentoring, leadership development. I personally have a coach all the time. Right? I have a coach who's helping me up level. Yes, I am a business coach. I have people I coach. I have high performing business owners that I coach anywhere from a couple million bucks up to 30 million and above. But I personally also have a coach, someone who helps me with my own business, someone who helps me look at things, someone that I can lean on when I have a difficult question, right? Leadership development, making sure that you're carving out those strategic thinking skills, that you're giving yourself that time. This is making you have more strengths that you can apply into the success of your business. And last, but certainly not least, this is one that I always, always end with, is self-care. Time off, vacation, family, friends. It is so critical to your success that you unplug from your business. And if you don't have the team in place and your management and your processes systems in place well enough to do this, make it a goal. Even if you're just taking a long weekend at first, and then you can slowly take a little bit more time and a little bit more time. I'll never forget the joy of helping my very first client take a two week vacation without having to stop the wheels on their business, right? Without having to put their business on pause. It was huge, right? It's such a proud thing when business owners can do this but it fills you back up. It replenishes you. It sets a great example for your team, especially in a culture like we've had lately where everything is so intense and there's been this ongoing drain with the pandemic and all the restrictions and all the worries and fears. Being able to show an example of unplugging and replenishing yourself is that whole concept of put your own mask on before assisting other people. It helps give your team the courage to do likewise, which ultimately will help keep your personnel in check and prevent you from having people who burn out. So I wanna ask you, what could be possible if you or even your highest value team members got some of their time back by really considering this money test paradigm to think about your time is your money. This way that you invest your time, what you're gonna get back out of it. When you're in those entry level and those intermediate level jobs, when you're doing those jobs in your business, the return on that time is so small. But when you're doing these larger jobs, these sphere of influence partners, think about it. If you met with a, a potential um, referral partner who brought you one project a week, one project a month, one project a quarter, what could that mean for your business? That hour that you spend investing in that relationship, what is the return on your time? And that is what this money test is all about. Because when you can think about it that way, you might be inspired to hire a little bit sooner so that you can get some of that time back and generate more of that long-term value for your business and make yourself more sustainable. What could be possible for you 
if you really thought through this and applied this to yourself and your business? What actions would you take knowing what you know now? There's some things that you can certainly delegate, right? I talked about these high value things, you know, your, your um, online reputation, your um, reputation management and your um, satisfaction surveys. Those are high value, but just because they're high value doesn't mean you have to do every single nut and bolt of it. It means that you need to keep your finger on that pulse. You need to be paying attention to where it goes. And one of the things you can certainly delegate is your online reputation. Right. And since Yelp is our host here, I want to make sure that we look at there's lots of different platforms where you can have this new reputation going on or you look at how your reputation looks on from a digital footprint and you can have a team member go in and do all the background stuff. But there's lots of things that you can delegate, even if you're still overseeing it in a big picture way. So this is one of one of my clients who really loves their their Yelp and who takes a lot of time and consideration to make sure that everything here is complete. Right. This is available to you. If you haven't captured this listing on Yelp, make sure that you're either doing it yourself, high value activity, or you're delegating it and overseeing it, managing the outcome. Because there are so many details here that when a consumer lands here, you get such an increased value from this glance at your business that's so worth the time you're going to pour into it. So there's all sorts of things you can do from a verification standpoint, from a, um, a project or product line standpoint. You can have so much jam-packed into this page. It's incredible. There's lots of things that when you highlight them, you earn these little marks of 25 years in business, custom solutions, locally owned, available by appointment, free consultations. You can also adjust your services offered. So you can have this very tailored to what exactly you do. It doesn't have to be generic. It can be a specific snapshot of your business. And then of course, it highlights some reviews for you right off the bat. Making sure that you're taking control of the things that are well within your control, such as this, or delegating it appropriately, that's a pro management tool. So with that, I really want you to pause and consider. If you're saying to yourself over and over again, oh my gosh, why are they not doing what I want them to be doing? Have you given them the purpose, the big picture reason as to why this is beneficial to them. What's in it for me? W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? With them, right? That's the purpose, whether it's for them personally or for their contribution to your business. Have you provided them with the tools, the nuts and bolts pieces that they need, the systems, the processes, maybe even the software, the checklists? Have you given them the tools? And have you provided them the training? Have you broken down step-by-step step the things that they need to know and learn? Last but certainly not least, have you given them the time? Have you paused to consider the value of your time and where you're devoting that time? And if you're devoting it in those lower yield categories that are still essential to your business, are you having the bandwidth to hire and to train up team members so that they can step in and do those things for you and you can amplify your success in the other categories of your business. These four simple, powerful questions can be game changers for you if you let them. So one more piece that I have promised to you. And of course, as we go, don't forget that the Q&A box down there is for our, our questions. And if you have aha moments, if something's really striking you, feel free to share it in the chat. I always love to ask for ahas at the end, so I will certainly do that when we get there. But if you have something that's really just striking you and you want to share it with us, feel free to do that in the chat. But the very last thing that I promised was, what do you do when people still aren't doing what you want them to do? How do you handle it when you have some member who just, no matter what, they're just still not doing it, right? Can feel really frustrating when you have to have these corrective conversations. A lot of people handle corrective conversations in the wrong way. And what I want to give you today is a very simple structure that's powerful. Now, don't confuse simple and easy. The only reason it's simple is that I've taught this literally thousands of times, okay? I've probably taught this technique to five to 7,000 people, okay? This technique that I'm going to teach you is what I like to affectionately call a criticism sandwich. Okay, because we are going to wedge the criticism in between two nice, squishy, beautiful pieces of bread that we're going to feed to our team member. 
when you're, we don't call this outside of this room, right? We're talking with our team member. We don't tell them we're going to give them criticism sandwich. We tell them we're going to have a constructive feedback conversation. So when someone is falling short, you need to offer them the insight of what's going wrong and how you expect them to fix it. Sometimes we think that in bringing up the failing, the falling short, that it's obvious to them what they need to do differently the next time. But we need to deliver this in a way that they're going to be open to hearing it, right? Because I certainly have watched people deliver constructive feedback, kind of like a punch between the eyes, not, not, not physically, but emotionally, like, bam, you did that badly. And then the person is just demoralized and they feel embarrassed and they feel small and they feel unable to do better. What we want to do is to deliver constructive feedback in a way that someone walks out of that conversation feeling empowered to do it better the next time. And there's a simple process on how to do it that I'm going to teach you right now. So this is our beautiful criticism sandwich. We're going to go over all the different components of it. It's simple. It's just four things, and it's going to make delivering these conversations way easier. Remember, we praise in public. We, we, we tout everyone's good things in public and we always criticize in private because this is something that depends on your personality and your upbringing and your, your everything about your life. For some people, this is really bitter and it's very hard for them to accept being corrected at all, even if you do it with finesse. So we always do it privately because we don't want to add embarrassment and humiliation and shame on top of the shortcoming. They already know that they've made a mistake. They already feel bad about it. Even if they're pretending they don't, they probably do in the inner recesses of their heart. So we want to make this as, as easy for them to hear as possible. Okay. So we do this privately and it's best to ask permission before just doing it. Do you have a little bit of time for constructive feedback conversation? Pull them into an office. If you're in a shared open office space and there's nowhere private to do it, take them on a walk, right? Don't do this in front of other people. It will not land, okay? Part one, what's going well? We always, 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 always start with what's going well because we want them to feel encouraged. We want them to feel like they're not all just bad. Now, if you've searched your brains and you can't even find one thing that's going well, I'm wondering why are you having a constructive feedback conversation at all? A constructive feedback conversation is giving your team member a chance to see clearly and to behave differently. And if you can't even find one thing about that employee that you feel is going well, one piece of their job, one piece of their work that you're proud of, then I'm wondering why are you keeping them? Okay, so challenge yourself if you can't even find one shred of something that's going well. Now, this is not sunshine up the behind. This is something true and genuine that is truly going well. This is something that you feel like is real for you that you want to admire and appreciate about them. One or two words, one or two sentences. You don't need a huge long paragraph. You're doing this in person. You just want to talk through a couple of things. What I'm really proud of is, you know, lately you've been showing up on time. You're really dedicated and you're doing a really excellent job with most of what I've given to you. That's the first part. Next, what the exact issue is. Do not beat around the bush. Do not ask them what they think. Do not make them guess. Do not be vague, okay? But say it straight, say it clear. For those of us who are very direct communicators, this is easy. For those of us who are not direct communicators, who generally come at things from the side and direct, this is not easy. Right, this can be quite difficult to do. So take the time to write down, to prepare this conversation. What is it? What is it exactly? What I'm really not thrilled about is I've walked through with you many, many, many times how I expect the phone to be answered. Let's just say someone keeps answering the phone and they answer with a hello instead of with your business name. You want to walk through with them what the exact issue is. Next, you want to tell them what you expect to change, right? You need to be clear with them about what does winning look like? What does success look like in this, right? You need to be clear, just as clear in what you want as the intended outcome versus as what you want, what you want to note as the, as the problem, okay? So what you expect to change. So what you want them to do differently. So from now on, what I really need you to do is answer the phone with a daytime greeting, Good morning. This is Madeline. 
daytime greeting, your name and the company name, and then an act of service, right? Good morning, this is Madeline with Emma McRae. How may I help you? How can I direct your call? What makes, what, what makes you call today? That's what's expected to change. Now I took a really simple, easy one here. I took a really soft, soft pitch here, but yours might be a little bit more hairy and, 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 and technical, but make sure that you're clear about what number three is, what you expect to change, how you want this to look when they do it correctly. Okay, next one. Um, we want to do number four, which is why you believe it's possible. What a lot of people do wrong is they do not number one, they do two and three. They tell you what you did wrong and what they want to do differently. Number three, number one allows people to be open to your corrective feedback. Number two gives them clarity on what the problem is. Number three gives them clarity on the solution. Now, number four gives them the internal fortitude, the willingness, the belief that they can do this, right? You know, I know that you're a creature of habit. I know that you've been answering the phone like this for a really long time, but I've seen you use past success. I've seen you adapt to this and this change in the business before. And I know that you can absolutely make this change. Here's why. Here's the skill. Here's the past proof. Here's the reason. You have a heart of service. I know you want to do this well. You have to show them before you leave the conversation why you believe they can do it. Because a lot of people, as I mentioned, they take criticism really, really, really hard. And they walk away from a constructive feedback conversation feeling like demoralized and embarrassed and like that they can't do it right. And we want to break up that thinking before it even goes down that path. Okay, we need them to walk away feeling like, you know what? All right, I was stumbling a little, but I got this. I can do this. Because your goal in managing this team is to be able to lead them to success, to give them that successful outcome. And if you don't supercharge your belief in them and their belief in themselves, that's going to be something that really impacts their ability and their willingness to adapt to the changes that you need. So this criticism sandwich is a small but mighty tool that you can dip into any time that you need. And I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to stop my screen share here. When you learn how to do criticism sandwiches really, really, really well, you can use it everywhere in your business and in your life. It is such a powerful tool that you can leverage in so many ways to help lead you to success. So I want us to close up our conversation here before I open for a few questions. I, we're gonna wrap up right at the top of the hour. We're gonna stay on for a couple of Q and A. So if you have a little bit of flex time, we'll be doing that Q and A here right, right, very shortly. So you wanna communicate well and treat them even when they've done something that you dis are disappointed in, even if they have had repeated mistakes, but you've never really had this conversation with them. You wanna communicate well and treat, treat them with the trust that they had when you brought them on board in the first place. You would never have intentionally hired someone who you didn't believe in. So make sure that you tap back into that belief when you have this conversation with them so that you both walk away towards the intended outcome that you're looking to have. So with that, I wanna open us up for some q and I know that I saw a bunch of questions popping into our Q&A as I was asking for them. So thank you guys so much. And Emily, if you wanna chime in at any point, I'm gonna open up the Q&A here and see how, um, how what, what sort of questions that we have. And if there's anything more that we want to add in, then, then we can absolutely feel free to do that. My email is right there at the top of the page. If you would like to uh, communicate with Emily, her email is there as well. Um, if you'd like to reach out to me, you are um, more than welcome to do that. And also what, while I'm looking at these q and I also want to let you know that I have an amazing new tool box coming out. It's called the Home Pro Toolbox. It's going to be launching on Black Friday. So if you want to get on the wait list just to hear more about it, you're no obligation whatsoever. If you loved what I've been sharing today and you'd like to hear more, this Home Pro Toolbox is a great tool where you can go in and put these quick and quick answers to your most tricky business questions. And you can sign up to get on our wait list right there at the website, homeprotoolbox.com. So, okay, Shelly had a question. How do you give a sense of purpose to entry-level employees who are only doing top tasks such as copying, scanning, entering data. Okay, great question, Shelly. Totally love that question. So here's what I would say about that. When you have someone who is doing something entry level, remember that there's always going to be an upper ripple effect. It's going to ripple effect in your business, no matter which level they're at. 
So if this copying is helping you keep your record straight, why is that important for the business? If entering this data is critical to this other big, bigger business thing, you have to share with them how their small contribution is giving you a bigger outcome. Right. Maybe it starts off as a teeny tiny little tiny ball and you roll it into this beautiful big snowball that, that creates a bigger business purpose. You wouldn't have people doing unnecessary activities. If there's absolutely no business contribution to the activity, why is it being done in the first place? So share with them those bigger purpose to the business, how their work actually is meaningful. Even if it's repetitive, even if it's entry level for them, you have to show them how it contributes to a bigger picture. So the this example I like to use is filing because filing is the bane of a lot of companies' existence. When you have a specific filing technique that you want them to use and to follow, you've got to tell them why. Because if that piece of paper doesn't go in this file, in this place, when someone else is coming to look for it, it's like that paper never existed. And it makes people have a better outcome more predictable success when you file successfully, right? Simple. All right, Shelly, let me know if you got what you needed there. Um, and if not, feel free to pop something into the chat or back into the comments. Thank you. All right, Beth, so smaller firm, all about managers being working managers. How do you do this, right? How do we make time for their people? So what I would say, um, and Beth, I know you had a little bit longer question than that, so I'm just paraphrasing a little bit. How do you... Um, make changes. So what I would say is if you need change to cr be created in a larger organization and you're not the one who is able to call the shots on that, right? You need to start at home, right? Do it with your own organization, your own department first. Do it with your team first. The way to implement great structure is um, is to make sure that you are doing it predictably. So setting up some meetings, daily huddles, one-on-one -on -one meetings with your team members, helping them set up their goals and objectives and helping them backwards engineer what they need to do to get there and track that success on a weekly, bi-weekly, monthly basis. Make sure that you're putting these in place first in your department. And then if you need management at a higher level to hear it and to be able to um, be open to doing some of these changes, that's when you can lobby for them by showing them how effective it's been in your organization, right? That would be what I would, I would suggest, Beth, for you in your case. All right, how do we, um, tips for having workers find their own answers rather than coming to the managers. Okay, love this one. Thank you, Ken. And for those of you who need to duck out at the top of the hour, thank you so much for joining us. I have absolutely loved being here today, and I hope to see you on a future webinar. But just going to answer a couple more questions here that that popped up. So if you have a little bit of extra time, I'm going to get to all these questions. What do you have um, tips for getting workers to find their own answers? Okay, so I call this having made myself when I'm the one who, who's done this, the easy button. When I make myself the easy button, it means that someone comes to me and asks me a question, I give them the answer. Have you ever heard the phrase you want to, I'm going to stop my share here and just talk to you all. You want to teach a man to fish instead of giving out fishes, right? If you're the one, if they come to you, just give them the answer and they come to you and they give you the answer and they come to you and give, then why are they going to stop, right? If you just keep giving out the answer, why would they ever stop? Why would they change their behavior? Because your response to their, to their behavior, to them coming to you is giving them what they want, which is the answer. Now it might seem harsh, what I'm gonna suggest here, but you can do this with kindness. You don't have to do this with meanness. And if you do it with meanness, it's gonna undermine everything you're trying to do. The first way to get people to look for the answers is when they come to you with a question is to say, hey, that is a great question. Affirm first, right? That's how you don't seem harsh. Hey, that is a great question. I see why you're asking it. What have you, where have you looked to find the answer? And let them tell you. If they say, hey, I haven't looked anywhere, direct them with where to go to look for it. Because you might be thinking that they know where to look and they don't. So you need to help shape their thought processes. So they're using you as the shortcut because it's easy, right? You're the easy button. So make yourself not the easy button. Make yourself send them back, have them go look. Hey, if you have questions or if you don't find what you need, come back to me and I'll work you through it. Yes, it will take longer in the short term, but in the long term, you're going to be freed up 
from all of those questions. There's lots and lots and lots of other techniques, but Ken, uh, let me know if you got what you needed with that answer. All right, Naomi, are the green categories for managers in addition to owners? So when we're that's when we're talking about the money test, you have those red categories and the green categories. You have to look at your specific role, right? What is your job title and what are the high value components where you can either save or make money for the business, increase productivity, save or make time for the business versus those lower levels. So yes, this was kind of like a, an owner manager, but a, a leader, a higher level leader. If you're more of a middle manager and that those categories don't exactly fit, you have to rethink what those categories would look like for you. And if you need specific targeted support on that, shoot me over an email. Um, I shared my email earlier. It's Madeline at MM McCray. I know that's hard to do, so hold on a minute. Um, not, the spelling of that is trickier than it might seem. So let me pop my email here back up on the screen and you're welcome to shoot me an email to ask me more specifics if that wasn't sufficient. So let me just share this here again with you so that you have it just in case you need it. Okay, let's see what other questions we have. I hope that was enough for you, Naomi. Um, what do you think is the best structure for team meetings? Oh, Chris, that's a great question. That's a big, long answer. So the quickest structure is to start with wins, to address open topics, and to end with ahas. My one little tip is never end with questions because you never know what people are going to, going to be handling. Um, short and sweet is better than long. And more frequent with less content is much more powerful than less frequent with tons of content. So there are tons of different structures for team meetings that you have to consider. It depends on the type of team and the type of meeting that you're running. But if you really think about you want to start about what's going well, what are the what are the issues at hand, all the different departmental or team related topics, what are the issues, the problems, the successes, and then you want to close with with an aha or a a next step or something that's positive and motivational to get them to be willing to do it. Um, super cliff notes on that. We could use a whole other webinar to talk about all the structures for those team meetings. Great question, Chris. All right, small company that is finally installing a manager to function on the owner. Hard for an owner to take off what they have. <laughs> yes, so true. Okay, it's really hard when you've been doing something for a long time to delegate. My number one tip for delegation is to remember that it takes time. You have to be patient with delegation. It's not an instant Band-Aid fix. It's a long-term fix, right? Think about a Band-Aid versus a surgery. A Band-Aid, you put it on, okay, that solves the problem right there in the moment. A surgery is more invasive. It takes a lot longer to do. It takes a lot longer to heal from. And there, it's not a, as quick of a fix, but it's a permanent fix. So learning the art of delegation is super, super, super important. And when you're in a position that you're bringing a management manager on to help you manage people, that person, you are needing to give them the support and to hand off things that are gonna be quick wins for them and then to do the longer term things next. I talk about a five phase um, onboarding process because there's different stages of learning and different things you're gonna hand off. The, the faster and easier things you can do first and quickly, and the harder, longer, more complicated things to delegate are the things that you need to work a little bit more diligently on over a longer period of time to let go. So Tracy, thank you for that great question. And yet again, um, learning how to delegate is one of those things that we have a bunch of content on it actually in the toolbox. And that's one of those things that takes a, a um, little bit longer than a quick Q&A to answer. Okay, let's do one or two more and then we're going to go ahead and wrap up. You guys have been fantastic. I really, really, really appreciate all these great questions. Um, could we chain, train our staff, staff to expect the criticism sandwich so they can ask, um, why do you believe I can do this? So here's what I would tell you. Um, that's a great question. I actually have had business owners not want to use a structured approach to, um, to constructive feedback because my team will know what I'm doing. Yeah, they're going to know what you're doing. They're going to get used to the format, but you don't want them to be responsible for the format. When you're giving crit constructive feedback, right? Criticism sandwiches are a fun way. We call it just among us friends, but we don't tell our team it's that. We tell our team this is constructive feedback because your language, your approach matters here. Constructive feedback means I'm going to give you feedback input that's going to help you build yourself up. 
where criticism sandwich feels a little bit less elevated. Okay, so that's our fun friendly word that we use in the circle of trust, and then we call it constructive feedback. So yes, over time, your team will learn the structure. You need to teach managers the structure, but you do not need to teach the structure of constructive feedback, that criticism sandwich to your team. You just need to serve it to them. Your criticism sandwich should never be something that they have to fish for. You need to give it to them fully designed, right? Don't have them ask you, why do you believe I can do this? Just volunteer it. Just tell them. You're demonstrating trust. You're demonstrating belief. I get where you're coming from, where you want someone to ask, hey, why do you believe I can do this? But that's not what we're doing when we're in a criticism sandwich. That's more of a coaching. If you're coaching them and working with them on some finesse things, then you want them to solicit that feedback from you. But when you're in a constructive feedback conversation, you design and deliver the sandwich completely and it's not on the shoulders of your employee, right? Their job is to hear your feedback, to understand it, and to implement. That's their job, right? And your job is to construct and deliver that beautiful sandwich. All right, thank you all 